Welcome to the Para Podcast. I'm your host, Sandra. And today we have a special guest on the podcast episode. And it's not just Mia. We are going to be joined by bird nerd Sophie. And we're going to chat about all things parrots all over again. I'm so excited for this one because you guys are going to get to listen in on our bird mom chat where we chat about our own little birdies. I'm going to ask Sophie all about her flock and we're going to get some awesome tips and tricks from Sophie as well. And this is just going to be a really great episode and it's going to be colossum fun. So without delay, let's actually get this show started. Sophie, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. And I know yesterday we were (laughs) chatting and we didn't end up recording the whole thing. So I still took a lot of value from our conversation and it was so much fun, but we're going to chat some more about bird things today. So let's start off with you telling everybody a little bit about you, how they can find you on social, on YouTube and your experience with birds. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, Very excited to be here again. Um, So my name is Sophie, also known as Bird Nerd Sophie. You can find me on uh, Instagram, TikTok and YouTube. Normally Instagram and YouTube are where you can find me most. Um, But I've been working with birds for about 14 years now. Um, All different kinds of species, which I absolutely love. Um, And I've been things like a zookeeper, zoo presenter, um, head of birds at a farm park, lecturer, lots of different jobs, um, which has been really rewarding to get so much experience of lots of different species. Um, but currently, um, I am a parrot behavior and training consultant with my partner, David, at Best Behave Birds. Um, so we help um, parrot owners globally um, via things like Zoom calls, uh, sometimes in-person calls as well um, when you're in the UK. And we have uh, an amazing time kind of solving parrot behavior problems, helping with general training, diet, um, and just anything really, live training sessions we watch too, which is always good fun. So uh, you can find us at bestbehavebirds.com and also on Instagram and Facebook as well at Best Behave Birds. So we've got a lot going on, um, but we absolutely love what we do, both with the YouTube side of things and also our consultation service. Yeah, I actually have been a fan of yours for a long time because when I would do research and, you know, watch YouTube videos, I would always come across your videos as well. (laughs) And so I was watching your videos and learning from you too. And then I found you on Instagram and then eventually we slid into each other's DMs and then this (laughs) beautiful bird mom (laughs) relationship Mm -hmm. blossomed. But I've always looked to you as well for information. So whenever I get DMs or comments or emails about certain things where I'm like, you really need to look at a lot of different factors here. And this isn't just going to be where I can help you with just one reply or a quick paragraph. This is something that I really recommend you consult with. And I'm so glad that I also found you and that you and David also provide that service to people. Because when I first started out as a bird mom, when we first got mango, I really found it hard to find good quality, like parrot information, care, diet, and all that stuff, or even someone to do consultations with. And originally I came across bird tricks, but then over time, once you start really looking into the community and finding people, then you find that there's so many other options. And so I always send people to best behaved birds for a consult because it's just so convenient. You do it through video globally. If you're in the UK, it can be in person. You even offer texting. Plus you offer people plans. Like I just feel like it's such great value that you're giving people and you're helping people you know, go a deeper into behaviors and diet and all this kind of stuff. And that information is not always out there. And sometimes we need to talk with a claw professional. <laughs> <laughs> I love that phrase. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much information out there. And one of the things that we love is like 99% of our content is free. We have like between me and David, we have, and David is the parrot teacher for anyone who doesn't know. Um, we have about 600 free videos across YouTube. We've got loads of free blog posts on our website. So most of our content is free, but obviously we can't give like dedicated one-to-one help to every single person who kind of drops us a comment. You know, a lot of it takes a lot of time and effort, which is why we set up our service and we make it as affordable um, as possible, as well as it being bespoke. But it's, you know, it's great fun to really delve into things because 
sometimes biting isn't just biting you know you can't just be like okay a quick little comment and then it's sorted there's so much more it's like layers upon layers of what could be going on so it's it's really like a little kind of investigation and trying to suss out what the different things are that are going on um so we we just love what we do and there is so much misinformation on the internet um everyone's got a lot of opinions not all of them science-based um, and we are always learning you know that's one of the things that we love to say is doesn't matter how much experience you have you can always learn you can always question what you're doing already and say is this the best practice still you know what could I do how could I do it more efficiently how can I make this better for me and my bird so um it's it's good to consume lots of different research and information even if you consume stuff that you think oh that's not quite right at least you know that that's not right and you can also share that with other um people who have birds that hey this is isn't how to do it but there's other ways that you can do it properly so i think that's also interesting that there's a lot out there but sometimes it does come down to a bit of common sense and common sense isn't always that common <laughs> which i find funny um <laughs> but look at it realistically like is this um situation going to help my bird or is it going to make things worse? Yeah, there's a lot of things that you brought up that I want to touch on. <laughs> one one thing that I do also want to say is it's part of the reason why I started the podcast, because I'm like, I'm constantly researching. And as content creators and bird lovers, we're trying to help other parents be better parents and share all the information that we're learning and taking in or something that we uh, topics that we have really come to understand and know really well. And at the same time, I'm like, I totally recognize that I'm constantly learning. And, you know, I've only been a bird mom for like four years. So I don't have as much experience as you or someone else. So I started this podcast because I'm like, how can I bring more information mm -hmm. and, you know, really talk to the pros so that I can learn more, but everybody who's listening can also learn so much more. So yeah, I love connecting with other creators. And I thought this was a really great way to do it. And I also remember we were chatting the other day about Mia's wing because I had taken her to the vet to see uh, or for to get her checked out for her annual checkup and the way the vet handled her something had happened with her wing and I was like Sophie I need your help because sometimes you're going to google something and you can't find that information or it's going to give you all kinds of information and then you're just going to be freaking out because <laughs> Dr. Google does that whether it's <laughs> with our own health or our, our pet's health yeah and so sure. that's when I was like you know what, I need to reach out to somebody who's going to have more experience or going to know, and you were my go-to. And so <laughs> I really thank you for that help because it really calmed me down because I thought something was wrong with her wing. But then when we talked through it and I showed you Mia, then we realized that it's probably just a moved pin feather or a feather in general. And before this situation, because we learn with situations as things happen as well, I also had no idea that something like that could, you know, cause her so much soreness or discomfort. Yeah, absolutely. Pin feathers are really, really painful because they have that little blood vessel in them because they are like living, growing things until they've fully formed and then the blood vessel gets cut off. Um, and a little knock on that, a little maybe like dent or bend or something like that can be super painful and you, know, you can really freak out that your bird is unwell. But one of the things we spoke about yesterday is, I mean, I'm a really anxious person. I'm happy to admit that. I've been very vocal about that. But if there's ever something, <laughs> I think most bird parents are on that. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm like, oh, what does this mean? Is this um, safe? <laughs> one of the things that I try and do to combat my anxiety, if I think that there's something wrong with the birds, is um, I try and look at it as if I'm trying to advise somebody else. So I'll step out of it and be like, okay, what's going on here? Are they eating, drinking, playing normally, vocalizing? What's the weight like? What's the poops like? What's the general behavior like? And look at it as a broad picture. Because it's very easy to just look at one thing and be like, ah, it's the end of the world. This is awful. Straight to the vets. And I'm not saying don't go to the vets. Like, if you think there's something wrong with your bird, just go for peace of mind. But it's very easy to kind of freak out. Um, so it's good to kind of adopt that approach. That imagine that you're trying to help somebody else with their bird if you're in that situation too and you know a lot about birds. See so if you can take a step back and be like, okay, what is actually going on here? Let's look at it without any emotion. What are the things that are going on? And let's go from there. And I find that quite useful. Yeah.
actually approaching it in kind of like a way where you're like, okay, let me look at the whole picture. Is she acting normally? Is she able to fly? What are her poops like? Is she still eating? So looking at all that stuff and considering I had just come from the vet, I was also like, I don't know if I need to go back to a vet, but let me see if I can get someone's opinion like Bernard Sophie (laughs) and see if, you know, does this require an avian vet visit with maybe another avian vet or is this just something where she's feeling a little bit discomfort and it'll be okay in a few days? Cause I did inspect the area. I tried to, you know, touch it very gently. And I was like blowing the feathers out of the way so I could see the skin to see if there was something going on. And I did notice that one of the pins looked a little bit bent, but mm. I had no idea before our conversation that it could cause her, you know, so much soreness and cause her to scream and stuff. So that just goes to show that we're constantly learning and connecting with others is a really great way to keep learning. Another thing you mentioned was biting. And I know this is something we went over a little bit yesterday. And I think we both get asked about biting all of the time. And (laughs) I've made videos and a podcast and a blog, but I'm also not super experienced with all kinds of bird bites. I just have my experience with mango and with Mia. So since everyone hears me blabbering about biting all the time, why don't you share like your top three tips when someone is struggling with a bird that's constantly biting, mm-hmm. especially with hands and fingers? Yeah, for sure. It's it's super common because birds explore their environment with their beak. You know, it's just one of their tools. And unfortunately, sometimes um, it goes a step too far. Um, The first place we normally look at, because we do have a lot of consults with biting as well, the first place we look at is normally diet, because uh, diet has such a huge influence on behavior. People don't realize just how much that you can almost solve behavior wise if you just tweak the diet. And for that, we would be looking at high sugar diets and not just um, like unhealthy stuff. We're looking at way too much fruit for different species, like some species like lorikeets and lorries need lots of fruit and nectar and that kind of thing, because that's biologically and species appropriate for them if you're giving conyers like a whole bunch of grapes like one grape is the size of their head and that we're seeing people giving like conyers three or four grapes a day that's so much natural sugar which is still going to be like pent up energy that they're not going to be um kind of getting rid of so that can definitely lead to biting also like highly processed foods we want to be avoiding those in the bird diets anyway we want to be having a nice natural biological appropriate diet that's made up of sprouted seeds grains and legumes some dry seeds and grains too veggies a little bit of fruit and um, because fruit is good and you can get like low sugar fruits like lots of berries and as love berries are so amazing like blueberries and they're in season <laughs> right now mm-hmm. the strawberries right now are so good so Uh, good and the blueberries and the raspberries i'm like give me all the berries (laughs) all the berries all the time um you know some soaked nuts but the birds tend to make a huge mess with berries usually everything like the windows my blinds they're all splattered in red i'm like or blue (laughs) uh what else we thinking uh herbs spices flowers avian teas you know you can have such a broad varied and diverse diet which again can solve a lot of behavior problems or at least reduce them so you can work on training techniques um you want to want to be looking at husbandry as a whole for kind of point number two have we got hormones spiking is there something in the cage that's maybe again triggering hormones um ways that we interact with our birds you know some people stroke their birds all the way down their back and you're essentially simulating the act of doing the naughty <laughs> with your bird yeah. you don't want to do that you want to be nice platonic friends with your bird um pg-13 so, <laughs> exactly we want to be looking at husbandry as a whole and, and seeing that and that's something we do in our consults as well we look at cage setup and sleep and uh, interactions with the family but the final point as well is also going to be how you respond to biting and we all know it doesn't matter what size bird you have their bites hurt it's just you know it's a fact and it's really hard for us especially if you have a low pain threshold to not react because when you do react you know your parrot doesn't see it as you getting angry or you telling them off they're just like wow there's so much noise and there's movement and this is really exciting so then they're more likely to do it they don't know that you're swearing or you know whatever it is that you're doing that's really angry because obviously bites hurt so the best they way just to see that they're getting a reaction and they're like, this is fun. Yeah, they'll do it more. <laughs> um, and also we mentioned yesterday, uh, sometimes they link cause and effect. So say, for example, uh, they bite you 
and then you put them back in the cage all they have to do is bite you when they want to go back in the cage or be put on the play stand or whatever it is so they do learn from experience and um what happens after different things so the best way to approach a bite if you get bitten obviously try not to react as much as possible we're all guilty of it sometimes because they do hurt but do your very best keep it internal until you've set your bird down just try and be nice and calm don't look at your bird but you want to kind of get them somewhere neutral so not in the cage not on the cage not on a play stand just somewhere that's not reinforcing so like the back of a chair is normally a really good one or on like a, a table or something and then you want to remove your attention from them for about three to five seconds so you're essentially teaching them that when they bite the fun stops my human doesn't give me attention it's really boring but the really important point which a lot of people don't do is after those three to five seconds is go back and give your bird an opportunity to earn reinforcement so that still linking okay bites mean nothing happens that's directly what happened afterwards however when i participated in this training whether that's target training doing a little behavior like a wave then i got something really tasty so i want to participate more in that then in biting and it does take a lot of patience you know it's not just a case of ignoring a bite once and all your problems are solved you obviously have to look at the bigger picture anyway and why the biting is happening in the first place because not all bites are equal you know they can come from trauma they can come from hormones they can come from excess energy there's lots of different things so um just follow the kind of biting protocol of not reacting setting them somewhere neutral but also giving them a chance to earn reinforcement after they've learned that the bite is where the fun stops if that all makes sense <laughs> yeah 100 percent. and i also love that you were talking so much about diet and that was your first point because i'm always talking about diet that was probably the first thing that i learned when we brought mango home was diet and how important diet is Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I really heavily focused on and I'm always blabbing about it. So I'm glad that you also mentioned how important diet is. And usually that's my first suggestion to everybody look at diet because our birds in our homes are captive birds. So they're not out in the wild foraging, flying, you know, and just being as active as they would be out in a jungle. So having too much sugar or too much fat can really cause a lot of not even behavioral issues, but also health issues, right? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, fat isn't necessarily bad. Like they need healthy fats and a lot of people are scared. But, of their birds yeah, fat. but like, like an all seed diet is what I mean. Yeah, for sure. You don't want all seed, but you want some seeds. You don't want all nuts. Yeah. You want some nuts. But I always recommend if you're feeding anything processed, anything that's not natural that you would find growing out in the world, that kind of stuff is to just look at the ingredients and say, is this the sort of thing I want to be putting in my bird? You know, research individual ingredients because it's so important because, you know, if the ingredients list is quite long and you don't recognize the names, that's something to maybe consider. But that's that's a whole talk for another day. But yeah, diet is, is really influential on how your bird behaves. And also treat motivation is so important too, because again, if your bird maybe has a really healthy diet, but they have, for example, with a cockatiel, they have a whole sprig of millet in their cage and then you want them to train for millet, you know, why would they? Because they've got that millet for free. Again, it's like me trying to uh, have pizza for dinner and then someone wants me to work later for pizza. I mean, I might, because I like pizza, but I'm probably <laughs> not going to be as motivated as if I had salad for dinner and then someone's like, hey, come and get some pizza real quick. I'll be like, I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> especially so, if it's Hawaii. <laughs> I love pineapple on pizza. Some people I'm, think it's I'm, weird. Yeah, I don't mind. I'm 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 not anti. I'm, I'm not for any kind of I pizza. like all the pizza. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm not discriminatory when it comes to pizza. Um, don't give your bird pizza though. That's one. Yeah. No. No. Just as a <laughs> just as a point that you know, treat motivation is really really essential when you're doing any kind of bonding taming training work with your bird you want to know what their favorite treat is so david has a great video called the treat hierarchy test where you can actually do a physical test to work out what your bird's uh, first second and third favorite treats are and then you can reserve them out of the diet purely for your training now we don't condone any kind of food deprivation no starvation because that is no good but you can use the diet to your advantage when you save those really really reinforcing and high value things only for when you're asking for behaviors or you're trying to work with your bird you're going to have more success because they're going to want to work for it they haven't got it freely available in their bowl but if they do then they're going to be less likely to work for it and then you're going to find it really hard to make any progress in your training 
Now, if someone is listening right now and they're like, oh, well, my bird is on an all seed diet or they eat just seeds and fruit every day. That's what I feed them. I want to help them with diet and get them on a healthier diet. What would be like your top tip for diet conversion? When we look at diet conversion, you'll see lots of different things online from different influencers and different people. For me, I always say it's better to go slow. Slow and steady wins the race. There's no point rushing your bird, trying to get them onto a new diet because you wouldn't do it with other animals. Like when you try and change, for example, a dog's diet, if you try and do that overnight to a brand new kind of food, they are probably going to get an upset stomach. And whilst yeah. a, a parrot's digestive system is very different, it's the same principle of putting your bird's body under stress with foods that they're not familiar with. Or you're going to come down to potentially your bird not eating that food and that's where regular weighing is so important because you can see if they are still eating if they are eating too much you know sometimes birds who've been on an all seed diet maybe do need to lose a couple of grams so it's good to liaise with your vet and do a full kind of body exam um, but when you're looking for kind of nutritional advice it's good to be really broad with all of your sources and really question what advice is being offered to you but in terms of diet conversion the biggest tip that I can offer for anyone who's struggling is to just try the same foods in different ways. This is one of the things that we say to just about everyone. Now I've got a video on how to get your birds to eat vegetables. Again, David's got similar ones, but it's very easy for somebody to say, okay, I've tried my bird with broccoli, gave it a nice big florette of broccoli and they didn't like it. So they don't like broccoli. I've tried it once. You can't just try something once with your birds. They're so fussy and they need to be tried on the same food multiple times, but also get creative with how you're offering it. You know, you could shove little bits of broccoli through the bars and that might tempt them. You could hang it up on a bit of string safely and they can peck it like that, like a toy. You can uh, rice it or dice it. So it's little kind of bits like almost when you um, kind of shave a bit of broccoli with a knife or a grater, it kind of looks like little seeds and a lot of birds will take to that really well. Um, Weirdly, one of the favorite foods for a lot of our birds is the actual stalk of the broccoli, which most people throw away. We just kind of chop it up and prepare it, wash it, and put it on the floor of the cage on the substrate. And they go rushing down there to shred it up and have a great big time. There's loads <laughs> of nutrition in that part too. So think about the foods you're offering and see if you can offer it in a different way. You know, birds really love leafy greens threaded through the bars or hung up in like a little herb bundle. There's just so many different ways that you can do it. But the key is to just keep going because if you only try things a couple of times, it's not going to necessarily get your bird onto a healthy diet and birds are prone to wasting food. Again, another video that I've got, but it's it's biologically in their natural behavior to waste food as well as when they're kind of trying new things. So that's something to consider as well. Diet conversion isn't always easy and that's OK, but it's really important to stick with it and just keep going and get creative with it. Yeah, it's not a race. Mm -hmm. It's a marathon. And yeah. we uh, <laughs> right. Is that it's not a race. It's a marathon. It's a race. Yeah. It's a marathon. <laughs> Marathons are long. <laughs> Basically, what I'm trying to say is it takes time and we just have to be patient and we need to be consistent. And like you were saying, we just got to try different variations. Like I make Mia her <laughs> chopped salad every single morning. And then sometimes like if I have like a chunk of broccoli or like I'll take carrot and I'll take the slicer and get really thin slices and I will weave it throughout her cage. And then I'll see her just go in there by herself she's like so excited to tear up this broccoli or this carrot or whatever else there is so there are so many different ways that we can get creative with offering food to our birds and healthy foods so that they can start to try them nibble on them and start eating them more so yeah basically diet is super important when we were talking about biting what was your second point because I remember I had something I wanted to bring up um it was just about like general husbandry hormones cage oh sex, yeah that kind of thing just that's the, the what I was gonna birth. say <laughs> What a lot of people also don't realize, especially, you know, if they're new to having birds is when we're petting birds on the back or on their wings or stroking them, that is not PG 13. And we're kind of telling our bird that like, we're a mate, but we can never satisfy them that way. So yeah, that's something that we don't want to do. No, definitely not. And <laughs> you know, some birds like Konyas will like to be held like an ice cream and that's super cute. But I love that you call it an ice cream. <laughs> I always call it the, the sea because <laughs> I always make a sea. <laughs> or a little like a little burrito or something. But uh, it's also really important to remember 
that <laughs> for some conyers in certain seasons with certain things all coming together, that can actually trigger hormones in itself. So it's about looking at your bird's behavior as a whole. If you feel like they're getting a little bit frisky, just reduce that and just stick to head scratches for a while. You know, you don't have to hold your bird like that. If they like it, normally that's great, but you just have to manage it in terms of their whole kind of behavior to make sure you're not accidentally reinforcing it. But you know, some birds are super cuddly. They love that, they love to snuggle uh, next to your neck, all that kind of stuff, which is adorable. But generally speaking, for petting, like the physical stroking of a bird, you want to stick it to the head and the neck. Um, I did a graphic that got a little bit controversial because people didn't like it when I said that. Uh, some people were like, oh, I love to massage my bird's feet. And I'm like, that's, that's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you can touch your bird's feet. You can touch your bird's body to health check them. That's totally fine. If you need to physically manipulate their feet for um, nail trimming, that's totally fine. But yeah. The physical motion on other parts of the body other than the head and the neck is just not appropriate for your bird. And we totally understand why people do it because... We do it to dogs and cats and other mammals, and they don't have the same hormonal responses as being stroked all over their body as uh, birds do because they're very different animals. So it's something to remember. Yeah, I think that's also another thing is that we were chatting about yesterday is it's so important when you're thinking about getting a bird or you got a bird, mm. then researching and really learning and understanding their specific behaviors and body language and sounds and needs and care and diet, because each species of parrots are going to have different, you know, behaviors. There's some things that are similar, like they all get hormonal, but there's going to be different characteristics. Like we know that Conyers are very social and cuddly, but other types of parrots might not have those same characteristics. So it's important to really learn about the species that you have, but then also getting to know your bird on an individual level, because each of them is an individual, just like we are. We have our personalities and they have their own personalities. So getting to know that species that you are caring for, but then also getting to know them over time and like what their moods are like and, you know, when they react to certain things, there's just like so much to learn when it comes to birds, right? Yeah, definitely. And while nothing can truly prepare you for bringing a bird home, like nothing really prepares you for that literally day to day um, kind of living with them, you can still try and kind of set yourself up for success. So if you can experience the species that you'd like to have in person, I know it's not always possible, but if you can, that's going to stand you in better stead because you can hear what they're like. Um, you can experience how they're moving around and how quick they are. You know, budgies are like on the go, quick, quick, quick. And for some people, yeah, I've seen that they're like, <laughs> yeah for some people that's like, really way too much crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know some of the bigger birds aren't as kind of quick moving and um there's lots of different things to consider you know you could even do like a zookeeper for a day or go to a, a parrot rescue if there's any in your area try and experience them see if there's anyone um locally who has birds who may be able to share experiences or um meet these birds in person you can do pet sitting and stuff like that to you know get real hands-on experience with them because um for example for me you know I've been working with birds for 14 years but I didn't actually live in the home with birds um until uh, a lot later on with that because when you work with birds like professionally as a zookeeper you know you're working minimum like 10 hour days um sometimes up to 12 hours in the summer um with everything considered and then you know travel home and stuff like that you can't have a bird and you know really manage your life and their life when you have such long shifts, you know, five days a week. I know there's some people that do it, but I know I could not do it because, you know, I wouldn't be home for them and that wouldn't work because birds need roughly 12 hours of sleep every night. So, um, you know, that even though I had all of that experience working with parrots, you know, when you actually have them at home and you have this whole lifestyle change of, okay, you can't have candles anymore, you can't have air fresheners, perfumes, nonstick cookware, anything that smells anything that could potentially release these fumes you can't have any of that in your home anymore and you know they, the birds have taken over the living room it's not a living room anymore it's the bird room and we just have some desks in there you know they just they take over every part of your life and I love that and that's one of the things I find endearing because my life is just all about birds you know it's work and it's home life but that isn't necessarily what's going to work for everybody and I think that's a, a real big thing that I would say to anybody considering having a parrot is they're going to take over your life and it's not you know it's not easy and that's okay I know there's days where I find it really really difficult to manage everything and that's okay but um it's 
it's good fun. Um, but it's hard work. <laughs> it's worth it. We love them, mm -hmm. but I think it also really depends on like your lifestyle and what you can manage on, you know, just so many different fronts, whether it's, you know, time or, you know, financially or how, how often you're home and things like that. So on it's holiday as well is like impossible. Most of the yeah. Time. Yeah. Like we used to travel a lot more mm. and now we travel a lot less. Mm -hmm. because I have like very specific people that I trust with my angels. <laughs> so if they're not available, then it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we moved abroad. And so my mom is my favorite pet sitter because she loves them and cares for them the way that I do. And so I don't get you know, to see her all the time. So she's not here all the time. And when she is here, I'm like, I don't want to go on vacation. I want to spend time <laughs> with you. Yeah. So, but whenever she does come, then it's always an opportunity to be like, oh, we have a really awesome pet sitter. But yeah, it's, I find that even when it comes to pet sitters, a lot more people are willing to look after Lambo than they are with birds because they're <clears> like, what if it bites me? I don't know what to do. I don't know in this situation. What if it flies? And, you know, there's just so many questions. So yeah, travel is definitely impacted and, you know, your whole lifestyle really changes. And it's kind of similar to like bringing a new baby home, you know, new moms, they read books, they watch YouTube videos, you know, they get pregnant for the first time and they want to know everything that they need to know so that they can care the best that they can for their babies. And it's the same with our birds. It's just kind of different instead of a human baby, it's a feather baby or like a dog, a fur baby. So it's definitely an adjustment. And it is a lifestyle change, like you were saying. And I think that a lot of times we don't realize that. Like when we first got Mango, I didn't realize until I started to learn along the way. And now I love putting the content and the information out there because there are so many people who are considering birds or just got birds or they watch some cute videos on YouTube or on Instagram and they're like, I want to get a parrot too. But they don't realize that it's a huge lifestyle change and there's lots of learning to do and there's lots of care and time involved and all that kind of stuff. Just like yeah, I think a baby. <laughs> it's also really hard for us as creators again we said this kind of yesterday it's really hard for us to show exactly what it's like because we want to put out the cute stuff because ultimately that's what the algorithm favors you know people want to see you know a little ice cream bird or you know all the cute stuff little petty pets or like our birds doing their training and things like that you know people love to see that do people want to see my birds you know screaming at 5 30 a.m in the summer because the light's peeking through the blackout blind or do they want to see them pooping in my hair or you know completely soaking the kitchen when they're having a bath you know there's, yeah. there's so many different things that or um, having a red pepper poop <laughs> and then you miss it and then it stains yeah I've got that's a video happened that I love <laughs> my furniture it has all <laughs> yeah. these red pepper poop stains yeah. completely ruined one of my beautiful hoodies that has parrots all over it because it's covered in red pepper poop stains they're, they're all real <laughs> they're big root it's the absolute worst um so yeah there's there's so much more and it, it's not easy and people sometimes get maybe the wrong impression and we do try and put out as much kind of realistic content you know you'll see some of my videos and the cockatiels are just wicking in the background like me you know it's like I can't you know I can't stop them they're birds they're gonna do yeah. it um but you know you're gonna have noise you're gonna have non-stop mess like you don't get a day off when you live with birds even if you're away on holiday like what's the bird doing are they okay yeah are they are they living the best i'm life? like the crazy like bird dog mom where i'm like i need an update like every hour send me a picture yeah. how are they doing are they okay are they breathing did they eat today yeah. what were their poops like <laughs> did they yeah, sleep I'm well exactly. <laughs> i'm exactly the same and um yeah it's you, you don't get a day off you know every morning like i'm up first thing in the morning because for example we have cockatiels and they're prone to night frights and I used to be a really deep sleeper but now I wake up at any kind of like someone can cough down the road and it's like right is that the birds I need to make sure they're okay and I don't need to rush in you know I don't sleep very well now because I need to make sure that you know I can rush in if they do have a spook um there's just so many different things that change and not all of them are like Disney fairy tale amazing the birds come to you while you're cleaning you know there's yeah. there's, there's so much more <laughs> we're not it. snow white over here <laughs> Oops. exactly so it's tough at times um so you have to be prepared for the tough times as well as the the cutesy times and snuggles because it's not always like that 24 7 yeah 
I also get a lot of people really interested in turquoise green cheek Conyers specifically because they see videos of Mia, Mm -hmm. but I'm constantly reminding people that just because you get a turquoise yellow sided green cheek conure doesn't mean that they're going to be exactly like Mia. And I think that sometimes <clears throat> people will see videos of, you know, this conure or that macaw or that African gray and think, oh, if I get one, it's going to be exactly like that because they are individuals. There will be similarities in the sounds they make and behaviors and things like that, but they're going to be different because they all have their own personalities. Yeah, they all have their own likes and dislikes. Like every single bird in a flock of eight have their own likes and dislikes of food and toys and things like that. Uh, they all know different tricks and behaviors or we've trained the same trick in a different way with each of the birds, which is really fun. So um, yeah, don't just don't ever get a bird because you see one on social media. That's probably one of the worst reasons to get one other than just getting one because you want it to talk. Like There's plenty of people, again, that come into my DMs and say, oh, you know, I want a bird that can talk. Shall I get this uh, blue Quaker or something? It's like, I don't know. Like when Chip was a baby, he was such a talker. I put up a reel the other day of him, you know, babbling away like a little baby bird. And now we just get like two out of tune songs out of him and the occasional (laughs) word. And it's like, that's fine. I have no issue with that. And I won't lie. When we brought home the Crimsons, they are incredible talkers, the both of them. And I do have a soft spot for being told that they love me. You know, it's very adorable, but I would still love them just as much as if they didn't talk, you know, and that shouldn't be a reason why you get a bird. But equally, it should not be uh, a reason to get a bird because you saw one having a snuggle on Instagram or TikTok because you know not every bird is going to enjoy that or it's going to take a really really long time for bonding and training to get them to that point and that's okay but again it comes down to it's like a, a commitment like an investment lifestyle change for getting these birds and you have to be prepared for like worst case scenario of them being like ah, I can tolerate you but you know well we'll interact but I don't really want to cuddle and if you can like come to terms with having that then that's great. But if you can have more, that's also great. But, you know, it's not always going to be sunshine and roses when you live with birds. Yeah, absolutely. And since you brought it up, I've been meaning to ask you, I want to know about your flock. Tell everybody how many you've got in your flock, what types of species you've got in your flock and their cute names. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so we have eight, um, I don't know why we have eight. No, we, we have eight. <laughs> just acquire birds. Eight, that's a lot. <laughs> For me, it's, like, that's a dream. <laughs> yeah. But my husband is like, oh, that's not a dream for me. That would be really <laughs> loud. <laughs> no, we, we love them really. I, I joke. But um, we have two cockatiels, the bro- their brothers, Chip and Fish. Um, we have two Crimson Belly Conyers, Louis and Charlie. Um, and then we have four Green Sheet Conyers. We have uh, Louis, Pickles, Scampi, and Olive. And they're all just totally different birds they all have their own little unique ways of interacting with us what they prefer what they don't um and we just love them to bits and for some reason we're just overrun by conyers and we never expected that but here we are and we just we love we love conyers we love teals we love all the birds um and our dream is you know to have a parrot rescue like have some land and have aviaries I, I, me too that's I also my dream <laughs> Let's, club Let's together find somewhere in Europe and like come together and <laughs> get it. this land and do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's somewhere with good weather, maybe yeah. Spain. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's good fun, but it's it's hard work to manage all eight of them. But again, we knew that when we were taking them on, we didn't take them on and be like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> like we've we've made adjustments to our lifestyle routine and stuff like that because routine can really help in certain circumstances because you don't want your bird to be so set in a routine that they can't cope with change. But exactly. you do want to have something set to make your life easier, make it efficient and get stuff done. So that's definitely my top tips for if you have a large flock or you want a large flock is get some kind of systems in place and some routines for you as well, just so you can actually get everything done, because it is a lot of work to manage all of them, and make sure they're all OK. Yeah. And even like in your situation, you didn't just like get eight birds at once. (laughs) You guys had two birds and then you just slowly started adding gradually over time and then your flock just grew. So as each bird got added, you kind of readjusted your routine. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Obviously, it's it's a lot easier when you have less. 
Um, but there are ways of managing, you know, like when I'm doing the food and waters in the morning, I have like little serving trays. I can get all the waters on in one go, take it all to the kitchen, wash them all up, come back with all the waters. When I used to just keep going back and forth to the kitchen with two bowls that I could carry, which makes no sense. Like that was just wasting so much time. So um, getting efficient like that, like I invested in a fancy food processor so I could do, you know, loads of chop. Uh, I always make way too much chop and I'm probably going to end up. <laughs> Me <eating> too. Myself, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> um, That's why I, now I just do it like in the morning and now I know because I've done it so many times that if I cut this small chunk, then it'll be just enough yeah. so I don't make like too much of it. But sometimes yeah. I do make a little extra so that the next morning I don't have to do as much chopping and I can actually do some makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a lot easier if you have like between like one and three birds, you can definitely do chop in the morning. I mean, if we had like a rescue setup again, it'd be so much easier to just chop everything fresh in the morning. Yeah. But when, you know, you're running a business and it's just me and David and I usually do most of like the morning chores and he does a lot of the afternoon stuff. And mm -hmm. that's another way that you work it if you have a, a multi-person household. Yeah. Um, it's just about kind of getting it done, getting it efficient and making it work. So again, you have time for the birds and you're not just doing kind of bird chores. Um and yeah, it just comes with time and practice. And again, being a zookeeper previously, I have a lot of kind of efficiency experience as to how to clean cages quickly and that kind of thing. Because some people tell me, bless them, they spend like two hours cleaning one cage. It's like, if I did that at the zoo, like you'd need like 10 zookeepers for one yeah. section. Like, it's not possible on a day. Um, you know, you have to find ways of doing things quickly, but still getting things clean. So that definitely helps, but I appreciate not everybody has that experience. So it comes, it's a real learning curve as to how to get things done and um, trial and error really is definitely important too. Yeah. And also watching YouTube videos for tips oh, yeah. and tricks because <laughs> we share that stuff all the time. <laughs> uh, I'm so paranoid. I keep looking to make sure that it's recording. I did. <laughs> it better be recording. So my <laughs> eyes are not. like going around just because I'm checking. I'm like, you better be recording. <laughs> I do too. Um, but I wanted to talk about your green cheeks a little bit. So you've got four green cheeks, but they're all different. I know mm -hmm. that Olive is also a turquoise conure. Is she also yellow-sided? She's turquoise yellow-sided, yeah. Yeah, so, so she's turquoise. just like me. That's why I have such a yeah. soft spot for her. Every time I see her, I'm like, oh, look at your little face. Have you seen it? It's so cute. <laughs> I know. They're, they're like little twin sisters, like apart by the seas. But yeah. no, the turquoise <laughs> all over is like they have like a blue tummy, I think. Whereas our girls, they have this little cream tummy with a little like blue trim on the feathers. So, yes. Um, so cute. Super cute. So um, Scampi is yellow-sided um he's just like a little rainbow he's so beautiful every time I look at him I see more colors it's just really really crazy um and then we have pickles um there was a huge debate about what uh color something like a is. pineapple but not entirely yeah so so when we first took her on uh we were told that she was a pineapple I was like she's not a pineapple they yeah. have really red tummies uh then someone told me she was a cinnamon and I was just like whatever I don't I'm not really that fussed about mutations I'm just like as long as they're healthy I'm all good mm -hmm. with it and then we were told uh, by a few people that she is a pineapple turquoise. And I'm like, okay, fine. She's just my little pastel baby. Um, <laughs> and then Louis, our one-legged green cheek, he is a cinnamon. So we kind of have almost like one of everything, but we have two crimson bellied, but we tell them apart because Charlie has a little bright red patch of feathers here and he has black feet, whereas Kipling has black feet, but little pink toe socks, which is just adorable. <laughs> too cute I know. you have to send me his feet pictures I promise I won't sell them online <laughs> everyone loves the feet pictures of him it's quite amusing <laughs> um so with all of these conures so four of them are green cheeks and two of them are crimson bellies and I remember you were saying that the crimson bellies are quite different in personality and characteristics and what yeah. makes them so different from green cheeks and also to add on to that question another question between the four green cheeks do you find like any differences or major differences between them? Yeah, so I recently did a crimson bellied conure care guide because again there's so much misinformation on crimson bellied conures when we were researching them when we were offered to take on Kipling and Louis to start off with we were like oh okay so they're quite cuddly quiet in nature that's awesome not too bitey really friendly and loving and then Kipling came home we we're like well that's a load of rubbish <laughs> um and while you know it's taken us a year to really develop our relationship with him which is fine again we didn't mind the weight they're exceptionally hard work. They are basically like mini cockatoos. And for most people, I would say a crimson belly conya is not 
the right bird for them because they're such hard work I can't even tell you like last summer we were having to wear full-on like thick hoodies because their bites are so strong and um, they have a much stockier beak than green cheeks which means that their bite force is a lot stronger than green cheeks and green cheeks can bite really hard so that tells you a lot about you know how much they can bite they're slightly bigger they've got a shorter tail and they are very easily stressed and overstimulated so crimsons are often prone to plucking not all of them but they they kind of have a, a much um, thinner tolerance for stress and change. Uh, and again, you can work through that with different kind of training techniques, but as general generality, not only with our two, it's also with crimsons that we've worked with in consultations. Um, they're, they're just really challenging birds. And, you know, while they're lovely as well, you know, they're, our two are fantastic talkers. They're so smart. They're incredible at flying. Uh, now that we have developed our relationship they love a cuddle and that kind of thing but for the most part you know one wrong look and they can flip like that and they're like okay I'm angry I'm single-minded I'm going to do what I want whether you like it or not um oh which goodness. is also fun <laughs> so they that sounds very, fun <laughs> yeah um many a day where I'm like oh my goodness <laughs> but um we do love them but again they're very very difficult so that you need to really understand <clears throat> kind of what they're like but in terms of the green cheeks they're all totally different um even obviously they're different colorations but in terms of personality like pickles is such a dream like if we'd have stopped with her and only had her as Connie's, we'd have a totally warped perception of what green cheeks are like because she's soft as butter like she's always snuggling like, all she wants to do when she comes out is cuddle in david's eye socket she'll just sit here in his eye socket oh and just snuggle or sit on his head she's a real daddy's baby um and she loves me as well you know we're always playing and stuff and the thing with her is she loves scampi who is her like friend but she doesn't like other birds so that's mm. challenging and then we've got scampi he is incredible at flying like we do a lot of out of sight recall with him so he'll fly around the corner to come find us he's always up to mischief um always wanting to train and learn like he loves to learn um, and you've got Louis, he is a bit more of a hands-off bird currently, even after being with us for a year. And that's okay. He His start in life wasn't great. Um, he was uh, originally kept in a cage of about 30 other conures, like a tiny little cage covered in mess. Uh, he only has one leg and we don't know whether that happened when he hatched or whether that happened before his previous owner uh, rescued him. Um, and he takes a long time to trust but he does love to do recall mm. again he's kind of like a daddy's baby as well he's always coming to David he lets David kiss him on the tummy and on the beak and stuff like that and he's really uh opening up and becoming more confident Aww. um then who else have we got so we've done oh we've got Olive <laughs> baby Olive best of luck <laughs> um, yeah she had a really traumatic start in life and again it took a really long time to earn her trust but she is a soft little baby. She loves her cuddles. She's a real cuddle bug. But again, she doesn't really like many other birds. Um, she'll tolerate the cockatiels. And we noticed that she was ready for a friend when she was kind of seeking out their company. But she doesn't much like the other Conyers apart from Charlie, who is now her friend. So she she's not great at flying. Again, that comes from her start in life. She was badly clipped and kept in a cage for a really long time and never came out, um, which is just awful. So it took us so long to start her flight rehabilitation process and we have and she's getting better and being with Charlie like her confidence level has just skyrocketed since living with Charlie even they haven't been living together very long it's really really heartwarming but it just shows that within green cheeks even with you know color mutations and stuff they're all so so different and I love that about them but again you're not going to get like a little carbon copy olive or mia if you want to get a, a turquoise yellow-sided or you know a scampi if you get a yellow-sided that you, you don't really know what you're going to get to be honest but the more work and effort you put in the more you're going to get out of them and the more that your relationship is going to blossom as long as you listen to them because a lot of people don't listen to their birds they want their birds to do what they want them to do whether they like it or not and that's a really bad approach you know it's meant to be like a cohesive relationship friendship you know we're all in a level playing field here so allowing your bird to say no allowing them to fail there's just so much to it but um mm -hmm. yeah it's important to remember that you don't really know what kind of bird you're going to get when you bring them home um but you can have a rough idea of kind of species traits and things like that yeah and even when bringing a bird home like it's so important to bond and I know we talk about research and learning I sound probably like a broken record but it's just so important to really get to know them and 
Like Mia right now, she's perched up. She's sleeping like a cute little angel. And I just want to go smooch her up. But she reminds me of your pickles when you talk about pickles because she is soft like butter. She's such a mama's girl and Mm -hmm. she's really lovely. And I put out a lot of videos of her. And even when I'm doing YouTube videos, she's just like hanging out or sleeping in my hair. And she's really calm, cool, and collected a lot of the times. But she also sometimes will bite me or she'll get angry at something or she'll be moody or I'll notice like hormonal things. So, you know, not every bird is going to be the same. And I'm probably going to learn a lot more as we grow our flock Mm -hmm. because I really want to grow the flock. I just keep (laughs) poking my husband all the time I'm like I'm ready for a new bird so is me <laughs> are you ready for another bird but speaking to you know rescues because I know a lot of your birds are also rescues I love that so much because there are so many birds that are rehomed or people get a bird and they don't really know what they're getting themselves into or then they decide they don't want to do this in- anymore or you know they're gonna move to a different house and they're not taking their bird with them or whatever the situation is I mean I know life also happens life happened <laughs> to us and it wasn't really our choice it was like we were forced into this situation with mango, but birds are rehomed a lot. And I am totally open to bringing rescues in as well, because they all need a home and they deserve a loving home. So maybe you can touch on a little bit about, you know, rescues and why it's so important to give birds a shot. And if you're thinking about getting a bird, maybe going to a trustworthy, great parrot rescue in your area to see what kind of birds they have. Yeah, for sure. And a couple of things to start off with, you know, a lot of people think that birds and rescues are broken you know they're they've got all these problems not every bird in a rescue is like that sometimes it is just a case of life gets in the way you know for uh, Louis Kipling and Charlie they came to us because they have the most previous most loving owners you know they were kept so well that um Louis and Kipling's first start in life wasn't great but Charlie has come from such a wonderful family who still come to visit him now which is really lovely oh that's um, so sweet yeah they're so nice and I have a lot of respect for people who acknowledge okay there's something going on in life or things aren't working I'm going to take the time and effort to make sure that my bird gets to a really good home rather than some people again who come into my dms like my bird's not bonding with me my bird's just sort of sat there looking at me I'm going to swap it for another bird I had that the other day which really broke my heart you you know you have to keep going with it it's not just a case of well it's been a week and my bird doesn't like me or how's along and I'm just going to swap it for something else you know you're making a commitment to a living breathing creature and you can't just kind of you're responsible for them for their life for their well-being for their happiness and we want to give them the best life possible yeah you're not just like swapping a t-shirt for a different size you know it's like a real a real animal and you know you wouldn't do it with a child like oh my child's annoying I'm just gonna go and yeah (laughs) or like it popped out it's crying too much you'll pop what are you gonna do pop it back in (laughs) exchange it for another (laughs) one (laughs) <laughs> can't do that um, exactly so there's a few different ways that you can uh bring a bird home we do always advocate for rescues and we also appreciate that rescues can sometimes put a block in the road with actually bringing birds home not all rescues obviously because we are very pro rescue because you know parrots are the number one most rehomed type of pet in the world but there are some rescues who will make you try and sign up to like a subscription service almost for like having a bird and the bird never truly belongs to you. It always belongs to the rescue. And I'm not for that. I find that really weird because mm-hmm. you know, you're doing everything for this bird and they could just take it from you in an instant. So you really need to look at any kind of contracts or documents that rescues want you to sign if you are going to bring a bird home. But there are also lots of loving rescues out there who just want the best for these birds. They want to get them into good homes. And I really appreciate that as well. Now, you can also get birds from like selling sites like Pets for Homes, Gumtree, Craigslist, that kind of thing. But you have to be very careful with places like that. You don't know what situation they've been in. You don't know the health condition of a bird. You don't know if the picture that they've put up is actually the bird that you're going to get or if you're going to get a bird at all, because there are so many pet scams uh, on there or on like Instagram. People are saying, oh, yeah, I've been seeing those. Absolutely. Where they're using like someone who has a huge social media using their selfies with their birds. It happened yeah. to you too. Yeah. With mm-hmm. their birds and being like, this is the bird you'll get. Yeah. So we had, I think it was photos of chips stolen. Um, 
people trying to sell birds. Any kind of Instagram, the way they say, oh, we'll ship you fertile eggs, we'll ship you your macaw. It's honestly, I wouldn't even trust it. Like, it's not worth it. You want to be able to, as we kind of touched upon yesterday, you want to be able to, if you can, see these birds in the flesh um, or get videos, try and get multiple videos on different days and see if it's the same bird in the video or if they're just repurposing stuff. You can do like reverse image search on Google if you want to be like proper sleuthy to see if they're actually using the images that are theirs or if they're stealing them from somewhere else. Um, so you have to be very careful on those sorts of sites. And I do try and recommend staying away from them, but I also appreciate that, you know, there are some success stories there. So it's good to keep your wits about you and be very cautious. Um, and the other way that you can acquire a bird that is uh, preferential is also from an ethical breeder. Again, um, something I like to say a lot is I am pro ethical breeder. A lot of people just kind of tarnish breeders all with one brush and say, oh, they're all awful because they're breeding birds. But that's not the case. You know, there are breeders out there where you can go and see the parents and you can see that they are loved. They're kept in wonderful conditions on great diets. And you can see they're not like mass producing all these birds. You know, that's not what you want to see you want to see them that's how we got breed. Mia yeah exactly so you want to see them you know a good breeder will give you all the information you need they'll give you all the pictures they'll tell you their life story the you know, paperwork so everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but a poor breeder you can you can often get a feel for it and if your gut tells you no it's probably better to not do it but obviously as we said there are thousands and thousands of parrots in rescue so if you can go down that route then absolutely explore it because you know six of our birds are rescue or rehome situations and that will be what we'll do going forward if we ever acquire well, if when we acquire more birds when we move somewhere else bigger it'll always be that case because we're really passionate about that and you know we've shown that we can cope with even the most challenging of birds <laughs> and I don't think any can be quite as bad as some of the experiences we've had um so yeah we're prepared for anything and I think that um a lot of those parrots in rescues will make really really loving mm -hmm. companions for a lot of people Actually, speaking on breeders, when it comes to those unethical breeders, I think that it's important for us to have these conversations and talk about it more openly, because then maybe it'll start to happen less or people will become more aware and not go to these breeders. So there are a lot of red flags when it's an unethical breeder, like if they're giving you a baby bird that isn't weaned, or if they're just giving you the baby bird without any information, those are all red flags. And it just like breaks my heart, especially when I see this stuff online and like how these birds are kept, how they're treated, the conditions, the cleanliness. Mm -hmm. It's just so heartbreaking. And I just really hope that, you know, over time it stops. Yeah, it's really important to remember as well that you don't need any qualifications to be a breeder. And I think in the majority of the world, there's no legislation on parrot breeding. Yes, there's some things coming in for like dog and cat breeding and that sort of thing, but there's nothing coming in for parrot breeders. You know, I could literally just go today, get some eggs, be like, right, we're doing breeding now. I've got all these birds, you know, it doesn't That's take crazy. Anything. It's it's wild. And, you know, these are such long lived and complex animals and yeah. in their back garden and that's really sad um they deserve better do we even do. deserve animals they're so cute and sweet <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, humans <laughs> exactly. the worst the worst animal of them all um <laughs> so if you can um, rescue then absolutely go for it um because they're just so wonderful but just be really cautious when you are looking for a bird and just make sure that you are asking questions a lot of rescues um also have to have some kind of license whether that's like a charity license so you can ask them for that and if it's like a a weird back alley rescue that's not really a rescue that would be a red flag for that kind of thing um yeah there's lots of questions you need to ask and again you know yeah. dm either of us i'm sure and we can be like oh that looks a bit shady or that seems okay i've heard good things so mm -hmm. um yeah always just question question everything in life yeah yeah um i actually wanted to ask you do you also live in an apartment yeah yeah so how do you find having a flock of eight in an apartment? Because I'm always like, me and my husband are like, when we get a bigger place, bigger place or a house, then, you know, we can have a bird room and all, I have all these dreams mm -hmm. <laughs> and all these Conyers. I'm going to be the crazy <laughs> Conyer lady. All our neighbors are going to hate us because they're just going to be like, <laughs> all day, morning and night. Mm -hmm. But how do you find it being an apartment with such a large flock when it comes to like noise and space? Yeah, I mean, we'd prefer to be somewhere bigger. It's not that we can't accommodate. We've just kind of 
gotten rid of all my stuff so it's just the birds but um we I suppose we're lucky in that we're at the top of where we live so the noise kind of goes out the top rather than like the the building is screaming so that helps although sometimes there will be like out and at the top of the hill over there and then you can still hear them sometimes but not always um are your neighbors like really cool and chill and they're like oh Um, cool parrots we are probably (laughs) we're probably the most considerate neighbors in my block we'll just we'll leave it at that um a couple of nice neighbors and then everyone else is just garbage so um (laughs) it's fine we're probably the quiet ones to be perfectly honest um obviously not everyone has that situation I hope that everybody watching has nice neighbors who are quiet and considerate um but it's definitely something to consider you know they they are going to make noise even if you have um a flock on a good diet and hormones are reduced they're still gonna make noise um the one benefit though is typically speaking our birds make noise between 8 a.m and 8 p.m so they're not making noise in like the unsocial hours of the day so it's not like noise complaints would necessarily be an issue if we ever got them we've never had a noise complaint even with eight birds so I'm quite happy oh about great that. <laughs> yeah it's um, it's also a thing here too whereas like you can't make noise at night but from 7 a.m you can make noise and yeah. when we first moved here people were drilling and all Kids kinds screaming. of things I'm like yeah. at seven <laughs> in the morning but I can't do anything about it because yeah. it's allowed yeah. it's the time that you're allowed to make noise so yeah. when Mia is squawking her head off it's the hours that we're allowed to make noise and exactly. other people are allowed to make noise. So is Mia. Exactly. <laughs> Although I'm making noise too, because I'm just as loud as her. I think that's why we're like a great pair. Cause I'm like, yeah, la, 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 like singing, <laughs> dancing, screaming. My husband's always like, you're so loud. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> they say owners are like their pets. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's why when I like found Conyers, I was like, it's me. <laughs> I love it. So speaking on noise, I also get a lot of people that come to me when they're deciding between a conure or a teal or a conure and a Quaker. And I get this consistently. And since you have conures and teals, can you share a little bit about what their noise level differences are like? Like who's louder or who makes more noise throughout the day? Um, I think when they want to be super, super loud, they can be almost as loud as each other. Again, people have Uh this misconception that teals are quieter, but when they're on one, you know, even when they're singing, sometimes they have scream singing and I'm like, please at least do it in tune. (laughs) Like, oh my God. Oh, um, that's lovely. (laughs) I would say conies are probably louder, but that's not to say that cockatiels can't be really loud as well. Um, Especially males, because obviously they have the potential to sing and talk. Not all will be as beautiful as some of the things like the cookie song you see online which I just love mine don't do that it's just two out of tune songs but it's fine um but you know conyers can be so loud and after working with parrots of all shapes and sizes for 14 years I now have tinnitus so I can't hear very well because they've just ruined my hearing and that will happen to people if you have a lot of birds or you have birds over time it's going to happen because you know I think it's the Nande conyer which is like the loudest conyer maybe even loudest parrot I don't know someone correct me but they are exceptionally loud. They're, they're louder than sun conures. They are yeah. out of this the world. The gende and the sun conures are loud, but I've also heard that that mm-hmm. they're even louder. Yeah, it's and how can get any louder? <laughs> can be really loud. Like that was yeah. one thing that I really noticed between Mango and Mia is Mango is so much louder than Mia. Yeah. Like if I'm down the street, I can't hear her. Maybe if all the doors and windows are open, but Mango with everything closed he could hear us coming home and he was already screaming and I, or, I loved it because I'm like, Oh, he's so excited. We're home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's like, Oh my gosh, she's so loud. <laughs> yeah. But like if, if someone's watching and they want a quiet parrot, then this, this is probably the parrot for you or this one here, because every type of parrot is going to make some kind of noise. They have all have the potential to scream, even budgies. You know, it doesn't matter if you get a small bird, they can still make noise. Quakers, as you mentioned, they are so loud. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Are they louder than Conyers? This is good for anybody who's deciding between Teals and Conyers or Quakers and Conyers to get this insight. Yeah. Quakers. Um, a friend of mine has, uh, had a Quaker. I've also had a lot of consults, uh, David and I with Quakers. Yeah. They're, they're loud. I mean, are they louder than Conyers? They can be. 
but, and very piercing sounds as well. Like you just the sound oh, just gosh. goes straight through you. So yeah, they're just they're all loud. Like we. <laughs> but <laughs> if to... someone wants like of the quietest <laughs> yeah. of parrots, then you suggest budgies. I I just suggest stuffed animal. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant the budgie. No, no, no. Oh, stuffed a animal. stuffed I mean, animal. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, like boys. Yeah, birds are a loud pet. Like yeah. if you don't like noise, yeah. you like peace and quiet, then a parrot is probably not the right pet for you, right? Yeah. I mean, it's people often ask me like, what's the quietest type of parrot? And it's like, is there one? Like they all have their own potential to be really loud. So I wouldn't want to say, oh, female cockatiel because they don't sing and that type of thing, but they can still be really loud. Like th- there's nothing to say that they can't scream or shout or make little kind of twittles and things like that. You know, they can still be loud and that's not right for everybody. And that's okay. If you watch videos like these and you think, oh, actually maybe, maybe parrots aren't right for me. That's fine. Um, but don't get into parrots and think, oh, I'm going to get a quiet bird because it's not going to happen. Like there'll be periods of quiet, but they're also going to be periods of screaming and chatting and just, yeah. And there are going to be days when it grates on you as well. And that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Another thing that I wanted to ask you in regards to, you know, growing your flock is if someone has one bird, like we have one bird, we intended to have two of them together, but you know, the universe put a little dent in our plans. So for someone like me or someone else that's listening that has one bird and wants to add another bird to the flock. Now, would you recommend getting a different species, the same species? Is there, you know, should someone consider gender if they should get a female or male if they already have a female or male? So if someone's trying to pick another bird to add to the flock, what do you suggest? I mean, I would normally say try and get a species that's a similar size. Like if you've got a budgie, I wouldn't recommend getting a macaw because you're yeah. going to watch them like crazy. That's going to be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, even, you know, birds of a similar size have the potential to cause each yeah. other injury. But we always feel like it's better to kind of bond up birds to be friends with the similar kind of species. So obviously we have chip and fish who are brothers, they're cockatiels. And we do have crimsons paired up with green cheeks, but they're quite similar. You know, they're in the Konya family. You know, they, they may not be exactly the same and that's okay, but they can still understand a lot of their body language, communications and things like that, vocalizations compared to uh, other species. But that's not to say that a bird like um, a Konya wouldn't get along with a bird like a Quaker because they absolutely can. Um, and they could still have similar body language and vocalizations and understandings and postures and things like that. It may just take a little bit longer to learn that between each other. But bonding two birds can take some time, you know, for... Olive and Charlie, it took a month, but for Scampi and Pickles, it took eight months. So it can really take as long as it takes and that's okay. But again, it's kind of like getting any bird really. You have to be prepared for putting in that work um, long-term. And in my experience, it doesn't matter too much on whether you get males or females paired up with what you have already, but you just always have to be on it with hormone management. You know, you don't want eggs. You don't want any kind of breeding or anything like that. So you can keep uh, males and females together, but you have to be on it with the diet, with the sleep, with the cage set up, with the training, everything that comes together with hormone management. And you can have birds that don't produce eggs and babies. You know, we've got scampion pickles who are presumed male and female. Never had an issue with that um olive and charlie we have had no issues so far with that so um yeah that's something to consider as well um age doesn't play too much of a factor um obviously baby birds will need to learn a bit more about what boundaries are and what's acceptable but with any kind of bonding work between two birds you want to just take it nice and slow and go at their pace you don't want to rush it together you want to have their cages on separate parts of the room to start off with then bring them close together then do training through the bars like target training then you could do training outside of the cage if you've got two humans have one bird per human work them that way then you can move on to communal foraging and feeding on different bowls near each other, then bring them closer together and then on the same plate. And there's just so much that you can do, but you want to kind of do it step by step. You don't want to just rush them together because then you're probably going to have an accident. You're going to have fighting and then you're going to make um, like several steps back instead of kind of making one step per day. Is it possible that when you bring another bird and so very quickly, you recommend that it's the same species, but it's also possible that if they're, you know, similar in size, they can also get along. Preferable is similar or same species, but that's not to say that they can't get along with other species as well. Yeah. Right. 
And is it possible that, you know, it might take a month to bond or it might take eight, but is it possible that they might not bond at all? They just won't like each other. In our experience, again, with all of our consults and everything like that, you can always achieve tolerance. So you can always achieve a point okay. where they are comfortable kind of playing in each other's personal space, maybe sitting on the same perch, maybe sitting on you together. They may not squish each other like Chip and Fish, their brothers. They petted each other once. And they've never done it since, uh, which is fine. But they enjoy each other's company. They enjoy kind of foraging together, that kind of thing. But they're, you know, I mean, they're brothers anyway, but, you know, they're not like super lovey-dovey kind of cuddling together. And that's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. If you can have a bird who can enjoy the company of another bird without them being like fully tightly knitted bonding, there's nothing wrong with that. But we, we've we never seen a case yet with someone who puts in like 100% effort all the time where you can't achieve a level of tolerance they may not be able to live in the same cage and again that depends on cage sizes but that's not to say they can't have you know out of cage time together or time with you together or training and things like that and again it's always a process that you can work on you know at what point do we say okay well that's it that's enough is enough you know all, you can always train always try and bond them more um, and go from there um I love all of this and 100% yesterday <laughs> everything you said I was like 100% 100% 100% I'm like wow I'm really agreeing with you <laughs> um but I wanted to also ask you to share a little bit about when you're bringing a new bird home, since we're on this topic, what's the best way to introduce a new bird to your home, to your flock with like quarantine? And I remember you mentioned about disease testing and doing all this stuff to make sure that everything goes groovy like a drive-in movie. <laughs> yeah, so we, our previous advice, again, this is how things change. Our previous advice was quarantine for 30 days. If you can get a vet checkup and the vet gives you the okay, then great, they can um, go and start mingling. But we are now more pro trying to get disease testing done, especially for PBFD and Bornavirus, because if that's the case, there's nothing you can do about those. And you don't want to be bringing that in and compromising your current bird. So you want to be disease testing. Yes, again, it's another investment, but it's so much worth it. You know, the amount of people, again, who have done this and realize that these birds who could have just come straight into the home may have put their own bird in danger. You don't want to be doing that. Um, you can still quarantine as well after disease testing, uh, especially if you don't know where that bird has come from. You're not familiar. Um, as an example of the other way around with Charlie, we were in touch with his owners, like we we're talking every day. He went for disease testing. He had a vet checkup. He wasn't exposed to any other birds. So when that was all done and okay, he could come into our home and we could go straight with it and start that process. However, with you know the others, we did the quarantine period of having them in another room uh, for a set period of time. You know, always washing hands between interactions, making sure we're using different sponges. You know, thinking about biosecurity and just keeping everything separate until you are certain that that bird is not unwell and that it's safe to introduce them to your current bird um so we're definitely recommending disease testing more now purely because it's becoming more kind of common knowledge that it's so important and you know it's better for peace of mind to pay all that money and be like okay they're fine it's good rather than to take that risk and not know is it really easy for birds to get sick from each other yeah, so the two that I mentioned, they are airborne. So even if you're quarantining in a, another room, you know, your room is not airlocked, like they're sharing yeah. space, so it's still a risk. And as we know, you know, birds hide signs of illness um, until it's very serious. So we want to make sure that we are not putting them in unnecessary situations, which is why we are so pro disease testing now. Um, and it can be done very simply by having the bird go to a vet having uh, feathers or bloods done um, and going for that package. It's normally in a package deal of some of the more common um, issues and then you can go from there. But it's better to do it and realise everything's fine than to not do it and be like, oh, I don't know if everything's okay or not. And then potentially, you know, you don't want to put your existing bird in any danger. 100%. 100 piece 100 percent. i normally say absolutely absolutely is my one when i'm like interviewing something it's absolutely <laughs> i don't know why when the camera goes on and it's recording i'm just saying the same things over and over <laughs> um so if someone is getting like a baby bird from an ethical breeder and they're like on a healthy diet, they're handled really well, they get a vet certificate and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, this bird is healthy. When they bring that bird home, do they still need to do the 30 day quarantine? If they've seen a vet, everything's a-okay. I would say no, 
Um, okay. Because if again, if you know where they're coming from and you're happy with the situation, some people will do it anyway. And if you want that peace of mind, there is nothing wrong with that. But if you've ticked all the boxes of having a checkup, making sure they're okay, they're from an ethical place, you know where they've come from, you've had disease testing as well, and everything's come back, you know, hunky dory, then I would say that that would be fine to then just go straight into having that cage on the opposite side of the room and then starting that process that I already mentioned because um, there's only so much we can do. You know, if, you, if you've got all the, the checkups done, then you're good to go, really. Yeah. And so once, so say your flock has grown and quarantine, disease testing, everything is hunky-dory, <laughs> then what are your tips for someone for bonding birds? I know it can take a long while. And, you know, if they have like an argument or they're trying to attack each other or there's a conflict, how do you intervene and how do you make sure that they have safe interactions and help them through that bonding time? Yeah. So you always want to have multiple resources. You never just want to have like one food and water because then they're going to fight over it. It's natural. You always want to have one food and water per bird that you have in your space, whether that's in the same cage or whatever it is. But also just go really slow. Like it's not a race. As much as we'd love to have these birds bonded up, you're going to have more success if you go nice and slow. But when you are doing this active bonding work and you are seeing how they will behave in the same space, you don't always want to intervene on every single squabble because then you're not allowing them to tell each other off and set their own boundaries. We only really intervene in that situation if they're going for each other's feet or they're going for each other's faces. Normally, if a bird wants to hurt another one, that's the places they'll go for. Yes, they can have a little beak bash. That's fine. But what if they're like squabbling, like trying to get at each other's feathers? I feel like that would really scare me. And I'd be like, no, stop. Yeah. Don't hurt you, each you other. Wanna, I love you too much. You want to watch them really closely. You don't want to just kind of look at them out of the corner of your eye and hope for the best. Like when we do it, we are right there watching them. And we also wear like a big hoodie. So if they are taking it too far or the squabble is going on a bit too long, and we're like, okay, you know, you said your piece now, like stop. Then we'll just kind of put our arm in between the birds to break them up, separate them for a minute. Because again, I would rather get bitten compared to having either bird be bitten and then let them cool off and be like, okay, you can start the interaction again now. Because sometimes they just need to be broken up if the squabbling goes on too long. But you don't want to intervene every single time they tell each other off. Because again, they're just not going to learn and they're not going to have the opportunity to tell each other what they like and don't like. How would someone approach bonding to birds? Like, do you do short exposures to each other? I know you mentioned having the cage at opposite sides of the room and then slowly bringing it closer and closer. How do you get them to like bond and be like Olive and Charlie? <laughs> so again, it comes from the things like the communal training, communal foraging, um, and just kind of sharing resources you know giving them little treats through the bars at the same time so they're always getting those high value treats at the same time um and it's better to do little short sessions and try and have them out for like an hour and be like okay we're all bonding now like it's going too too long you know with any kind of training session you think of it like a normal training session to start off with you want to look at sort of between two and five minutes and then go from there and then have their separate time and um, david the parrot teacher again has a great video on that of how to bond up two birds different techniques that we use some unconventional but weird techniques that we've used as well um because there's lots of different ways that you can do it but again it's just about teaching them to live in the same space and that neither of them is a threat and that there's always going to be plenty of resources and that they are friends and we're all part of the same flock together so yeah it's 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 a stressful experience but once you have put in that work it's it's really amazing cute and when you bring a new bird home and you already have a bird. So, you know, it's growing. Does the dynamic change with yourself? So like if I bring another bird now, you know, is the dynamic between me and Mia going to change? Is she going to be like, Hey, I've bonded with this bird, mom, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> or yeah. is she going to get jealous or <laughs> are they going to spend more time together than, you know, with their parent? So yeah. what, what does that look like? A lot of people are terrified of that. Again, we see a lot of misinformation on the internet of people saying, oh, if you get two birds, your bird will hate you and they'll bond up with their other bird and they won't want anything to do with you. And it's rubbish. Honestly, it's such a load of rubbish. I you love when you to... say these like <laughs> British things like rubbish. <laughs> Absolutely rubbish. So or have your wits about you. That's, that's, I'm like, I love it. it. Keep talking. <laughs> um, you you ha always have to keep putting in work. Like you, a bond is never just like, 
set in stone you always have to keep putting work in and it's the same if you have two birds or not and all of our birds are a perfect example of how you can have bonded pairs and birds who still love you all of them still want to interact with us sometimes olive is just so desperate for like daddy cuddles that she'll go over there you know she's not even interested in charlie he's with me or with pickles for example the second she comes out she just wants david um but when they're in the cage or even out of cage time she's snuggling with scampi they're they're watching the movies because we put on youtube for them they're like watching our videos it's so funny they love their movie time um (laughs) so i saw someone on instagram that does like reading time they read to their birds that's beautiful (laughs) <laughs> I love that. <laughs> to teach them like, you know, to hold their attention and things like that. So they do like a reading time. I don't know if it's on a daily basis, but I thought <laughs> I that was it. really I think cute. That's great. Um, but yeah, it's it's a total <laughs> myth that if you get more than one bird, they won't love you. It's it's not true at all. And I wish people would stop perpetuating that because again, it puts people off of expanding their flock and helping some of these birds in rescues come to a loving home because people are worried that they'll lose their bond with their bird and it's not going to happen. Again, keep the hormones under control and keep working on your both bonds with both birds and then you're going to be fine. And for parents with a single birds, is it a good idea to bring another bird or birds into your home to grow your flock mm-hmm. so that your bird can have that like bird companionship? Because obviously with humans, it's going to be different and they're never going to get that same fulfillment, I feel like, as they would with another bird. Yeah. So we are obviously <laughs> very pro multi-bird household. We have a lot of birds and we are not like trying to be mean to anybody who only has one bird like if that works for you and your situation you love your bird they have living their best life that's amazing there's nothing wrong with that we however, love you for it <laughs> <laughs> however I feel like you can like kind of level up their welfare and their lives by giving them a companion even if they're not best friends maybe they just tolerate each other they're still going to get so much of a deeper connection and communication with uh, the same kind of animal than they would with just humans and that's not to say that humans aren't enough but we can give them more. Um, And if you are willing to do that, I think that your bird's welfare and overall life will um, really improve because it's such a gift to let birds be birds. You know, we obviously want them to be part of our homes, but they are still wild animals. You know, they're not domesticated. They are only a couple of generations removed from the wild um, and they are not necessarily used to, you know, living in our homes. And we have to adapt a lot, which is why we talk about lifestyle changes, but allowing them that bird companionship is a gift that we can give them to allow birds to be birds. Oh, I love it. That's it. I'm finding a bird for me. (laughs) (laughs) Yesterday, it was really hot. I know it was hot here and it was hot over there for you. Mm -hmm. Did you end up getting that rain? We did. Yeah. Right after we So did we at four (laughs) in the morning. The storm was insane. It was like lightning and pouring rain. I just kept going to check in on like Mia. I'm like, is she scared? No, she's totally fine. And then I was checking on Lambo. I was more scared than they were. It was really pouring. My balcony got destroyed. Oh no. Yeah. Did you guys have that bad of a storm or? It was pretty bad, but because we play thunderstorm sounds to our birds, they were like, yeah, mm, no worries. I get really scared of thunder. I don't like loud yeah. noises, like unexpected loud noises, but the birds are like, eh, you just put on thunderstorm loud, so, uh, thunderstorm sounds that are really loud this time. This is weird. Um, they're always really cool with it, which is um, really great kind of descents for them because. Um, That's yeah, a really cool tip. That's mm-hmm. a way for like desensitization so that they don't get scared. Same with fireworks as well. Uh, if anybody, so you play fireworks. them every so often, like you find it on YouTube and you just play it for them. Yeah, brilliant! <laughs> Everybody, take notes. That's Write it. this down. <laughs> I love that. Look at that. We're learning. Okay, one last question, and then I'm gonna let you go because I promised you this time it would only be an hour. I know I've got to go and cook dinner in a minute. <laughs> we're, we're gonna be like bird mom besties. <laughs> so my last question, talking about. Um, you know, having more than one bird in your flock. Tell me a little bit about housing more than one bird in a cage. Mm -hmm. How many is too many? What is a good amount? Like depending on the bird cage size, obviously, how many birds can you have in there? And can it be dangerous? Because I've also heard of sometimes birds being together in a cage for like eight years and everything is dandy. And then all of a sudden one attacked the other or plucked its feathers or something happened. So I've always been like really nervous and 
I'm always, I thought to myself, you know, I'll have them in separate cages, but I know that you've got a lot of insight on that. Yeah. Um, all of our pairs are housed together and there are influencers who will, uh, say that you should house birds individually. Otherwise you can't keep an eye on them. You can't know their health, you can't know their poops, which I don't agree with because firstly, it comes back to like having birds being birds you know having been allowing them to kind of cuddle at night is so lovely like I watch them on my little pet camera when they're snuggling at night it's so beautiful to see but we also have like substrate in our bases and people say oh you know you can't monitor poops that way however if your bird is sick and they're doing unusual poops they're not just going to do one they're going to do multiples and even with all of our eight birds we see all of their poops every day we check on them when they're out and about because you want your bird out and about interacting with you um so that's not a reason to keep them separate are birds going to fight we can't predict everything but we can mitigate that again with hormone management with constant training making sure the resources are shared making sure that they have a big enough space where they can get away from each other if they want to now in the typical like large kind of appropriate cages for birds like the ones that we have we would say two is maximum if you have an aviary or a bird room of course you can have more than that but you want to be mindful about the actual space that you are giving these birds and having enough space for them to be separate if they want to we also recommend if you can at least minimum having like a decent sized travel carrier or a separate cage if you've got the storage so that if there was ever an emergency you can separate them but we personally haven't seen any issues where birds have been housed together long term and then they've suddenly fought but i appreciate it can happen but in my experience that sort of risk is very low if you've put in that bonding work and you haven't rushed things because have, giving them that companionship again if you know if you have to go out to work or school or university on holiday you know your bird has still got their friend with them that they're going to socialize with whereas if they're housed singly where are they getting that companionship from especially if you're not home or you're out for a little bit or that kind of so there's lots to think about but we are very pro housing birds together as long as you put the work in is it possible that if they're having an argument or they're fighting and they want to get away from each other, is it possible that one might be trying to get away and the other one is just flying after it, trying to attack it? And if you're not home or no one's home, then what what would you do in that situation? The only time I've seen things like that is, again, hormones being raging. So that can happen. So or you have to pay attention people. to that. And during that time, maybe have them in separate cages. I wouldn't necessarily split them. But I okay. would always work on reducing hormones because sometimes our birds will have a little scrap. We hear a little Mah! and then they'll kind of separate, but then they'll kind of gravitate back towards each other. Any persistent okay. fighting is either to do with a break in bond and trust between them. Again, you'd need to identify that or you've got hormones going on or the space isn't big enough, which is often quite common. You see birds kept in cages at may say that they're okay for two budgies but they are not okay for even one budgie so that's something yeah. to consider as well you know you need to have a lot of space when you're housing uh, more than one bird or, it, or even one bird to be honest you need a lot of space but that's usually the reason what happens it doesn't always happen just out of the blue for no reason yeah there are some cages where I'm like those are so small <laughs> um last question I promise this time <laughs> I have my favorite brands of cages but where do you get like your cages your aviaries or what brands do you really recommend like if someone I get this question all the time and I'm always like we have a Montana cage this is where we got it but you know you just have to look around what's in your area because the things that I was able to find when we were in Thailand versus in Poland are just completely different so what are your favorites? Or where do you find yours? Yeah, it's hard to say. So a lot of the Liberta range are quite good over here. We like the Liberta Oregon flight cage um, because it's the one that Chip and Fish and Scampi and Pickles have. There's a lot of room in there. It's quite kind of, there's a lot of space both ways. Um, and the one that we have for Olive and Charlie and Lou and Kip is a very weird name, but it's on my Amazon store. Um, and it's a lot of them are kind of marketed for rodents as well as parrots but you just take out like the shelves and the ladders they come with and then you've got this huge great big cage so it's really hard to say but I basically the ones in my Amazon store are good always look at bar spacing always look at the materials you're, they're made out of if they're like wacky colors like pink and green and blue I would be like that's maybe not safe yeah um I personally if we talk about personal preference I don't like proper dome tops like really circular ones because I think when you cut off at corners you're missing opportunity for enrichment um and there's some really odd looking cages out there that I don't like I like 
boxy kind of ones because there's more opportunities for enrichment um and you have more space and not space lost for kind of decorative purposes so there's just so much out there and so much like parrot products and cages and all this kind of stuff that I think that it gets confusing and sometimes mm -hmm. people just don't know so it's good to share this kind of stuff all right I'm gonna let you go cook dinner <laughs> I'm actually hungry myself so mm -hmm. I need to make dinner what are you making for dinner tonight I have no idea. I'm going to go and see what meals we have left. So it's probably nothing exciting. <laughs> I wish it was we did, <laughs> we did groceries last night. So I have all this stuff. So I'm like, do I really want to put in all that work? Or should I just order off it's my phone tempting, and it'll be it? here in half an hour? <laughs> but I'm thinking about burritos. Very I've been nice. on this Mexican vibe and I have Very wraps. Nice. So <laughs> I think that'll be fast and easy. It'll be burritos tonight. Nice. <laughs> again thank you so much for jumping on again I really appreciate your time and our chat and talking about all things birds um well thank you for having me it's been a blast uh, like it was yesterday so um you can find me at bird nerd sophie on instagram youtube and tiktok and you can find you might put your <laughs> birds i get really excited to know it's nearly dinner time um you can find us at best behaved birds on instagram and facebook and our website thanks so much for tuning in to the parrot podcast by poodles and parrots i'm your host sandra and have a awesome day